right, um, I'm just going to start by introducing myself. My name is Andrew Brown. I'm a freshman at Brown University. Um, I decided to concentrate in urban studies for three reasons. One was um, my family life. My dad is very involved in historic preservation. Um, and he, he jokingly calls urbanism the family business. Um, and another reason was that I watched my hometown, Silver Spring, Maryland, be transformed in front of my very eyes. It, it really went from a sort of has-been point on the map to the thriving, vibrant community it is today. And I, I, have, I want to know why, I want to know how other places can be just as vibrant and have such situations. <coughs> um, I also read the uh, urbanism classic, the, Great, um, the Death and Life of Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs, and it fundamentally changed how I look at places. And um, I mean, sort of Jane Jacobs' uh, power of observation is really sort of inspiring to me. Um, we're going to hear first from Barbara Fields, who's been with the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development since April 2011. Um, of course, we've heard a lot about HUD already, but it states that its mission is to create strong, sustainable, inclusive communities and quality, affordable homes for all, working to strengthen the housing market, utilize housing as a platform for increasing quality of life, and build inclusive and sustainable communities free from discrimination. Um, as HUD's regional administrator for New England, Ms. Fields serves as HUD's liaison to mayors, state and local elected officials, members of Congress, private and nonprofit developers, stakeholders, and customers. She leads HUD's regional efforts to implement a more comprehensive place-based approach to housing and community development. Before joining HUD, Fields served as the executive director for the Rhode Island Office of the Local Initiative Support Corporation for 20 years, as well as the Massachusetts Government Land Bank and the Boston Redevelopment Authority. She has also served on many professional community boards, including as vice chair of the Providence Housing Authority and chair of the Rhode Island Attorney General's Advisory Commission on Lead Paint. Um, she has a BA from Tufts University and a Master's in City Planning. Please welcome Barbara Fields. Thank you for that kind introduction. I, I just was whispering to Kurt. I remember I hear the introduction, I go, who are they talking about? <laughs> but um, thank you. And I'm really glad not only to be here at Brown, but also to be here with my colleagues from EPA and DOT, because this is getting very habit forming. And that's a good thing. Um, I was intrigued by, and I'm sorry I didn't get here a little earlier, because Alan caught part of uh, George's presentation, and it's always good to hear from Scott. Um, we are making changes in the federal government, and I think that's what we want to talk about a little bit informally. So for 20 years, I was running the office of LISC, and now I'm at HUD. I would say, you know, just with those acronyms, that's where I go. But, LISC is a national organization engaged in rebuilding low-income communities. And for the first 10 years there, we were working on affordable housing. And in the second 10 years of my time, we were able to really expand that program to invest in child care facilities, think about access to jobs, and work with the police. Because here in Providence, particularly, and then later in Woonsocket, we had some new leadership. And the first lesson, I think, for me is that leadership does matter. Leadership can bring the vision and the commitment. And then it really is the people at the local level in the communities on the ground who really get the work done uh, in partnership. But as we expanded that program, we realized that while we had been doing a lot of work, we hadn't been doing what I call connecting the dots. And so we started a program in, at LIFT uh, called Building Sustainable Communities, which was to strategically and intentionally link those investments not just go in and do something, building an arts center or, or building housing or childcare, but really linking those and involving community residents in a way that we can now call organizing because of the man who sits in the White House. We were always talking about it more quietly, but we were able to go a little more public around the fact that you need to organize, you need to bring community residents together and have a grassroots effort. And there's a new thing that I've learned is now that I'm working at the federal level, a grass tops effort. And trying, and LISC was sort of in the middle then, 
But I was excited to join this administration because they had a commitment to really changing the way government works and understanding that it doesn't happen overnight and it starts with small steps, just as it did in the work that I was doing in neighborhoods and communities throughout Rhode Island, um, in, in Woonsocket and in Olneyville, uh, neighborhood in Providence and Pawtucket. So the first thing is that we have a partnership for sustainable communities. Again, upcoming that word sustainable. And so I said, all right, what is this going to be about? But it really what started out with a simple idea that the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, would work with EPA and with the Department of Transportation, joining together with local partners and taking a pragmatic and regional approach to our investments. All three of our agencies are making investments every day in communities. But if we're not talking to each other and working together, we're not able to leverage those. Traditionally, there had been no coordination between and among the federal agencies. So it really started, um, I think, with our uh, secretaries in Washington coming together and then asking us to do that on a regional basis. It's still quite shocking when the representatives from these three agencies, or just two of us at a time, show up at an event. And I know that uh, Kurt and I particularly have beaten a number of paths together. Work, you know, starting with um, being at an affordable housing project here in Providence that was helping um, ex-offenders return into the community, which had also been a brownfield site. We were working together. To Bridgeport, Connecticut, where people were getting trained in green jobs and rehabilitating um, public housing in Bridgeport into next week, well, I hear Kurt's not going to join me, nope. but um, he's lucky to get to a, a program that EPA is doing called fix a Leap, which has to do with water conservation, something we don't talk enough about, I think, at HUD when we're talking about improving the energy efficiency of, of housing that we invest in. But we decided, could we work together? Could we at least have a public announcement at a site where HUD was investing and EPA was bringing in um, Delta, I think Delta and, uh, the pipe, and, and the union, the pipe fitters union, and together all being there and really working together across our traditional lines. So this is about smarter planning for jobs and economic growth. And there is in HUD, the um, UD, the urban development that the secretary talks about bringing back. And that means that we need to have housing that connects people to jobs that requires transportation connects our young people to good schools, safe routes to school, um, and as the, the First Lady, who I believe is up in Boston today, talks about move, uh, move more, eat right, or I put that right, I guess the, the acronym right, but again, fighting obesity. So all of that has to happen in a place, and the, it's a place where we're all investing. So I think that this federal coordination is, for me, has been a, 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 an outgrowth or a continuation of the work that I was doing at the community level and just doing it at the federal level, trying to connect and, and improve that our investments go together. Um, statistics show that 52% of a working family's income is devoted to housing and transportation costs. So just think about your own family or your own individual situation um, and spending that kind of money leaves very little money for food, medical costs, uh, and the other things, clothing, the other things that family needs. So we really need to focus on making sure that we have good housing near good transportation. If we're going to build a new train line through Somerville in Massachusetts, that then we're not thinking about making housing investments somewhere out in the suburbs. That maybe we can think about how those go together. And it's just a starting point. Um, so what HUD did is put up a pot of money for sustainable communities. And in fiscal year 10 and fiscal year 11, we had $100 million in those two years in that program. And I'm proud to represent the six states of New England because we got a significant number of those grants here. Um, some of them were for regional planning, and some of them were challenge grants for actually looking at implementational. Um, particularly up in, in Boston, we've been looking at the Fairmount Corridor and allowing the city to buy up lots along that line that can be then used for either affordable housing or small-scale commercial developments. Unfortunately, Congress did not see fit to put that into the 2012 budget, and we were extremely disappointed by that because we think this is the future. This is the opportunity to come together. Um, and hearing things like I did from the mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut, the New Haven to New York along the Metro North is one of those corridors where we're all working together. And for the first time, the mayor said, I'm not competing with the mayor of Norwalk. 
I'm not competing, competing with the mayor of New Haven and our Stanford, we're actually sitting down and working together. And I heard that up in, um, in, in Maine, between Cumberland and York County. We know each other, but it's the first time we're using your money to sit down and talk about regional planning and working together and not competing against one, one another, but figuring out on a regional basis what are the needs that, and how can we take the monies that are coming. That's the federal budget's been cut, but we still are making investments, so we have to be smarter about government investments and leverage off of one another. So I mean, I'd rather turn it over to my colleagues and come back to questions. I have lots of stuff here they gave me about ways that we're using this locally. I know that we just gave nearly $2 million to the state of Rhode Island under the direction of Kevin Flynn uh, to do a regional planning grant. And of course, for Rhode Island, it was uh, one region is the whole state. Uh, but that makes sense, to think about where are we making our investments, what are the land use policy and the transit investments we're making. And I know that that money that we're providing is allowing them to hire planners and to engage on, on, on a level that will, um, I think, benefit us in this, in this community. Um, I know that jointly with DOT, we did announce um, money for the city of Providence separately to look at five different transit nodes. And I think that is very important as well, um, coming together with, um, the, with the city. Um, and we can talk more about that, but I could turn it over, I don't know, the next speaker, and be glad to have more of a conversation. All right, um, we're now going to hear from Joanne Weinstock um, in terms of federal partnerships. Um, for two and a half years, she's been a, the transportation program manager in the Federal Transit Administration's Office of Planning and Program Development, where she manages grant programs and project development in Connecticut and Rhode Island. Uh, she works as a member of FTA's policy team and has been involved with the federal partnership. Um, she received the DOT's Secretary's Team Award for her work in the region's Sustainable Communities <laughs> Partnership. Before FTA, Ms. Weinstock worked at Smart Route Systems in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Division of Capital Asset Management on Sustainable Design Techniques, and the Massachusetts Executive Office of Transportation as an MPO Liaison Transportation Program Planner. Ms. Weinstock also graduated from Tufts University, where she received a BA in English and Environmental Studies, and an MA in Urban and Environmental Policy Planning. <laughs> okay, you Brunonians, we just found out we're both uh, tough jumbo stuff. So. <laughs> Coming on Silver also for um, inviting us and to my co-panelists Barbara and Kurt. Um, I actually have a lot of uh, connections to Brown. Three of my four parental units went here and uh, I, I also wanted to go here but no tough. So, um, okay. <laughs> so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give more of a, a I'm going to go into the details of our actual partnership on a month-to-month like -month basis, what we actually do. Uh, first, I think it's really important to uh, define livability. Uh, what does it mean? What are we doing here? Uh, so according to the U.S. DOT Secretary, Ray LaHood, uh, livability means being able to take your kids to school, going to the post office, going to the grocery store, going to the library, going out to dinner at a movie, playing in the park, and uh, doing all that without having to get into your car. It's also about having options or having a choice about transportation. We are not anti-car, but we are pro-choice for transportation options. Our partnership started in June of 2009, and uh, at that time I had just started at FTA, and my very first week I was brought along to a meeting, uh, one of the partnership meetings, and I didn't understand the need for the group. Uh, don't these agencies talk to each other? Or don't we pick up the phone and call each other? Uh, I guess the answer was not really. So um, that was my first introduction to our, um, 
a partnership, and I quickly learned that this group was established to join forces in helping communities improve access to affordable housing, uh, increase transportation options while, while lowering costs, and protecting the environment. So what does it take to build an effective partnership? Sometimes it actually feels like we're back in school and we are uh, collaborating on a project, somewhat like a keystone project, each of us with varying backgrounds, uh, lots of time constraints, and uh, but like a keystone project, we are actually affecting real lives and real projects in real environments. Specifically in our group, the evolution has been natural. Uh, one member of our group has assumed more of a leadership or captain's role, and she happens to be an expert in smart growth. She wasn't elected or chosen, but the group just evolved under her leadership. Our success also stems from some basic business models, such as strong leadership, which Barbara mentioned, good communication, and respect for each other's missions. Also important, understanding and respecting that each other's time is valuable. We meet monthly and we rotate locations. Uh, here are some pictures, uh, it's just a before and after shot of Upham's Corner, which is part of the Fairmont Indigo Line corridor, it's in Dorchester. Um, just one to throw some <coughs> before and afters in there. Um, so how can we achieve a successful partnership? So a major aspect of our partnership has been networking. Uh, alone we can do great things, but together when we pool our efforts and funds, we can do even greater things. Uh, when someone expresses a problem or issue, and instead of just thinking inside our own agency bubbles or silos, uh, we can actually use our contacts and brainstorm for solutions that might not have been obvious if it was just us individually looking at a problem. We are all more well-rounded as a result, and we are exposed to each other's programs and opportunities. Another benefit uh, is we have we're good at uh, identifying funding sources. We all have our own pots of money, but how do we maximize the benefits? We've also spoken at many conferences and functions together, and it's become a natural relationship because we're all working towards common goals. So um, here's an example of increased learning opportunities. Uh, HUD spread the word about a lunchtime presentation they were offering uh, to learn about metrics and um, it's about how to define, measure, and record change. And this was an interesting topic for all of us, but without the partnership, we would never have heard about it or even had the opportunity to participate. I'm gonna talk about some challenges that our partnership has had. Uh, we had a really good first year. We were very productive. We had three pilot projects, and we provided technical assistance to various communities. But one of the challenges we faced was the possibility of resting on our laurels. We also wanted to avoid a sophomore slump, uh, first year in the majors. Um, uh, also, we are doing what we can with limited resources and time. Uh, I can tell you at FTA, in my office, we only have 15 people total in our office, and we are providing services for six states, including the oldest and fifth largest transit system in the country, a VTA. So there's also an overwhelming amount of information that we all have to deal with. If you just go online and Google sustainability or livability, you will be inundated with information. We all want to do everything, but we have to be careful about what we take on. Another challenge has been learning and understanding each other's operating procedures including we all have our different time frames and planning requirements and project development steps and criteria and judging projects. So it's been a learning process. We want to have tangible results also. We don't want to just talk. We want to actually have results like resource guides, um, brownfield grants, projects and construction. Um, I have a document that I have uh, several copies if you're interested. Uh, this is a this is our partnership one pager, and this document has been extremely useful in spreading the word about our partnership, our purpose, and our accomplishments. 
all three agencies combined efforts on creating this document, and the EPA used its publishing resources to get it printed. And we are actually in the process of updating this document. Um, and also, EPA has some resources to shoot a video about the partnership, which I'll show towards the end. It's just four minutes long. Here's another example of uh, some fun data and visualizing data. This chart was put together by one of the HUD collaborators, and it's useful in organizing and visualizing some of the various concepts related to the partnership. Regarding interagency coordination, this is a photograph of the Federal Highway Climate Change Workshop that was held a year ago. Uh, this is an example of interagency knowledge sharing and the pursuit of sustainability education opportunities. There have been countless training and learning opportunities that we, have, we have, would have not had if not for the partnership. Some other examples of coordination. Uh, we have participated in each other's discretionary grant programs, including reviewing applications and notices of funding availability. And also, for example, uh, someone from EPA was on one of my livability grant review teams last year. She brought a different perspective and a lot of different knowledge to the table. And she called things to our attention that would have otherwise been lost in the details. Uh, this is a slide about one of our projects, the Fairmont Indigo Line. Uh, this is one of our first and major success stories. Uh, this project, specifically with a combination of HUD, EPA, and DOT funds, uh, the MBTA branch, this transit branch, has gone from underserving low-income populations to providing them with <coughs> rapid transit-like headways and stops at key locations. HUD provided funds to maintain affordable housing in proximity to the transit system, as Barb was talking about earlier, and EPA provided numerous brownfield grants and technical assistance to the area as well. Closer to home is the Providence Core Connector Project. Uh, this is an effort that's underway to bring streetcars to Providence. Right here you'll see a picture of a streetcar in Portland, Oregon, and um, RIPTA is actually wrapping up an alternatives analysis right now, and they will soon be pursuing funding. I recently returned from Portland, uh, where we had a streetcar roundtable, and just a little bit more about the Providence project. You can see on the left here is a map of the preferred route for the core connector project, and on the right is the Portland, Oregon map, just in case you're a map geek like I am and uh, enjoy looking at maps. Um, the Providence Project, the concentration is on meds to eds. There is a lot of opportunity to connect parts of the city that are currently not uh, well connected, and that also includes connecting the Amtrak commuter rail station. The study has a great website and Ripta and its consultants have done a great job investigating the prospects of a streetcar system in Providence. And throughout the course of the alternatives analysis process, Ripta hosted technical working groups and resource agency meetings. And at these meetings, staff from other federal agencies would share their knowledge of the requirements and processes. This early coordination helped to avoid conflicts later in the study. And this is where there might be an opportunity to work with private businesses as well. Um, they, there's an opportunity for them to contribute both time and money to come up with funds to match potential federal funds. Another project we're involved with is the Warwick Station TF Green Airport. Uh, we have been working with other federal agencies with regards to this project and its uh, TOD potential with HUD and also Brownfield with EPA. We're trying to organize a value capture workshop to educate our agencies about this funding mechanism, and um, that's scheduled for the end of March. Uh, this is our movie, and I'm hopeful that it'll work. Let's try. As organizations, as institutions, as government, we have this tendency to see 
community in silos, but for a family, they live it in, in a very holistic manner. So in my mind, I think one of the best things that has happened out of government is this creation of sustainable communities. Anything that you can potentially possibly think of that might be a problem or a need or a challenge is actually concentrated in this area. So um, one of our colleagues, Jean Dubois from Dorchester Bay, was the one that kind of coalesced us back in 2004 to say, hey, you know, we all have this rail line going through our community. It doesn't really stop. Uh, it's not adequately serving our community. So, you know, what do you want to think about working together? But along the corridor, um, about 90,000 people can walk to any of the proposed stations or the, the current stations. There's just there has been underutilized rail service. And this is not just a convenience factor, it's an economic mobility issue because we have 50% of our population, roughly, that actually works downtown. FTA has invested $37.3 million and the state has now invested another $137 million to build four additional stations. We have three stations in construction. Roughly in three years, uh, the residents will be able to utilize uh, all the stations along the cover up. That was very exciting yesterday when I went by there. Because usually you go by there and you're like, okay, what am I going to see? The actual kind of work going on. And yesterday, you can see the fruits of our labor. There has been a lot of uh, work done that people are embracing. They're seeing that the challenges but they're also seeing that their voices are being heard and respected. One day, the people who live in that house over there will jump on the commuter rail, the commuter rail and go downtown to the jobs in those towers down there. That's what this is all about. It's been an economic opportunity for people who live in our neighborhoods. We are taking this significant investment that the federal, state, and local government are making in transit improvements and using that as a catalyst for a broader community transformation uh, effort. We've invested um, $4 million in equity in um, two uh, real estate development projects along the quarter, including 157 Washington, which is uh, the EPA is supporting uh, Brownfield's work there as well, uh, very close to the new Four Corners uh, transit stop. There used to be a, um, like a, a car lot or a junkyard here. And so you have junky car cars piled up. You just had mounds of dirt and debris. People used to run by here, just throw their trash here. So this whole area is like a giant debris field. They were the driving force. I mean, they looked and they saw this eyesore. And they had the vision of saying, oh, this, this could be something better. And the fact of the matter is we, we need housing. The Talbot Avenue Station Transit Oriented Development Area, we did a visioning session with the local community to help uh, address some of their concerns and help get some of their vision down on paper. All the work that we do, trying to start at the from the ground up, working with residents to understand what their issues and needs are, getting people out of cars. They want that onto trains, but they also are concerned about some you know, density concerns related to transit or development. The EPA assistance helped design a concept for the Talbot Commons, so it was more of a community planning exercise. And then again, helps vet these TOD projects, transit-oriented development projects, with the neighbors. You're working with the neighbors instead of on the neighbors. And now we have a much more coordinated strategy, both with respect to our relationships with the federal agencies, HUD, DOT, EPA, city agencies and interventions, whether it's housing investment, green jobs creation, energy efficiency investments in the city and our local partners as well as our community-based organizations who are on the ground working every day to make that area more sustainable. So this becomes the model of how we do environmental policy, housing policy, transit policy in America. Thank you. you know, this approach, the attitude where government comes together and enables so much more. We're going to hear from Kurt Spaulding. Um, he has extensive experience in the uh, environmental protection field as an advocate, policy analyst, and administrator. 
For almost 20 years, he served as, as executive director of Save the Bay in Rhode Island. Um, he also established the Narragansett Bay Keeper and Habitat Restoration Programs, which reconnected Save the Bay to ecologically important bay issues and oversaw the successful completion of the $9 million Explore the Bay campaign and construction of the Save the Bay Center at Fields Point in Providence. He joined the EPA leadership team in February 2010, where he has been leading a holistic approach to finding environmental solutions in New England. He emphasizes environmental justice, the green economy, and uh, three cross-cutting regional initiatives, climate change, stormwater, and communities. Uh, he has been heavily engaged in preparedness efforts for um, natural disasters, particularly flooding in New England, and in sustainability pilot projects around the region. Um, his attention to urban revitalization can be seen in places like Holyoke, Massachusetts, and Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, please welcome Chris Fowler. I'm on, right? Can you hear me great? Excellent. So I'll just take this and put it down now, because that slide, the presentation that was just done, really captured, uh, I think, better than I could talk at length about, about the partnership, which gives me the freedom to just kind of add a few points. And I know we're, our time is tight, so, so I'll do that. And you know what's been really exciting about this is it's, it's built on uh, something few people at EPA a few people outside EPA really understand about EPA. And I think the presentation I walked in on with Greg talking about Cicero and about every other word he was talking about environmental challenges related to that urban place um, is, is where I want to start. Uh, before, before we had cool words like sustainable community partnership and sustainable urbanism and, and I just counsel everybody if you go down to Pro South Providence and start talking about sustainable urbanism when you're trying to restore an urban community, you won't get very far. Um, that's just an editorial comment. But the, 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 the thing that's really important is this, this thing we call community engagement and how we do it. And, 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 and understanding that um, what's happen what happened to our urban places was, um, I think Scott kind of laid it out, it, it was about as stupid a thing as America could ever do. You know, directly, purposely destroying cities with, with uh, subsidies that, that made it easy for people to leave. I, I'm always, uh, yeah, you're gonna get this brain dump, I'm sorry. I, I'm always amused when people talk about the American dream and how um, America, there's an American way and, and this idea of uh, the home in the suburbs with the picket fence and the three-car garage and all that sort of thing. Um, the American middle class, which we're talking a lot about in America today, um, gave itself a big gift when it decided to subsidize the highways and the mortgage interest reduction. Do you think those things would have happened but for those things? Probably not. So when we talk about subsidies and direction, we talk about something that depopulated our cities and left behind urban folks um, minority, lower income, left with, unfortunately, a, a disproportionate impact of, of environmental problems um, that affects their health, affects their well-being. And so when we look at this sustainable communities opportunity at EPA, we're looking at an opportunity to, to deal with something we call uh, uh, environmental justice or an, uh, an injustice, a, a two, two communities that we, we now have an opportunity to address in a very holistic, important way. Um, now, this conversation about environmental justice sometimes starts in very simplistic ways. You know, you have uh, toxic waste sites and they need to be cleaned up. And our Brownfields program, I think, is, is probably one of the best examples of how a, a federal agency can approach problems at, at a community-based level, work, working with partners thinking about future uses, thinking about economic development. So what, what we've done in that program over the years, and it's been a while now, is, is we've engaged communities in conversation about their place. You heard in that video of planning grants and that sort of thing to, to create jobs and well-being in, in, the, in the Fairmont, Fairmont Corridor. That's been going on for a long time. 
And it begins with really connecting with community and learning how to talk to community about what they're doing. It, it really does mean leaving behind words like sustainable urbanism and asking people what they want and how they want to get it and, and what is it going to take to do that. Um, now Brownfield's dollars come in and what I love about our, our program and Barbara leaned over me and said, well you have all the staff. Well that's right. E EPA is set up in a very uh, unique way for federal agencies in that um, we are a decentralized agency. I have 650 people working for me in, in Region 1 up in Boston. I think Barbara has about 125. I think Mary Beth Bell has about 15. 15? <laughs> yes. yes. I have less than So she has 15, 125. I have 650. Now, we've been working on urban problems because that's where the pollution is for a long time. And, and I was, uh, I'll just roll a little bit here. Uh, I'm very proud that I spent my 30 years in, in this business cleaning up urban waters. And I will tell you, I think the cornerstone of urban revitalization or urban well-being is indeed clean, clean water. When you look at what's going on in Boston, Boston is probably the prosperous, most prosperous city in America today. It is booming in Boston. Uh, Providence. But what were, where would Providence be if this, this, and most of you don't remember the suicide circle, and the train station nobody dared go to, and the brown bus station that was so dirty and dangerous, people didn't want to go to. Um, now up here on the hill, they kind of turned their back on that. And of course, RISD had all their, their buildings turned up the hill, not down the hill. Um, I, I remember that time. So but for the effort to, to, to reconnect Providence to its waterfront and its rivers, where, where would Providence be? Well, that's a rift on this, but the bottom line is, um, this community engagement has, has to be what, what people want and it has to be important to, to how, they, how they grow. And our Brownfields program has been part of all of that, all of that. Um, while we have fewer people and we have much less money, but our money tends to be the first money. We spend tons of time trying to figure out how to limit the liability, define the liability on urban properties so others can follow. And one of the more interesting parts of our partnership is working with HUD on trying to get HUD to understand that an elderly uh, urban, uh, public housing project on a slightly contaminated piece of property should rate as high as a project on a less contaminated piece of property. So we're trying to, we're trying to control and manage that risk all the time and incent those cleanups. And that's what this partnership's been so exciting. The fact that I can talk to Barbara and we can talk about these issues and start grinding our way through these, these, these priorities is, is intensely important. Um, I'm almost done. So one, one last sort of off the top of my head point that I really want to bring, bring out on this is that in, in, in urban places, especially the old urban places, New England, Midwest, um, we, are, we are essentially building the foundation of prosperity and, and a future well-being um, for, for years to come. And, and we need to remember what happened. Really, really dig in on this. Um, we had a booming urban metropolis here in, in Rhode Island. I think you need to remember that Rhode Island in the early part of the Industrial Revolution uh, put Silicon Valley to shame in terms of its economic vitality versus the rest of the, the country. Um, but a lot went with that. An awful lot of contamination and pollution went with that. And as, that, as we consumed that green capital, polluted the rivers, destroyed the land, polluted the air, um, people left and that disinvestment process started. So to get that reinvestment process, we, we absolutely have to make these places safe and healthy for the people that live there. Um, that's been the story of Boston. Uh, you, you met Mayor Menino um, in, in, our, in our film. Um, one of the most interesting people I've ever met, quite honestly, because he's a hardcore old-time pal, understands neighborhoods, but also thinks the big picture. So, recently he was able to stand next to Boston Harbor as he was celebrating the location of a, of a uh, pharmaceutical company ready to build its headquarters along Boston Harbor. Uh, and he said, but for the cleanup of Boston Harbor, this, this pharmaceutical investment w w would not happen here. Um, that kind of uh, rebuilding the foundation so we can have prosperity, rebuilding our green infrastructure is vital. The last, last point I want to make is, when we're all said and done, uh, we don't want to go through a flurry of good thinking and good work and good things happening 
and say, wow, we in the federal government, we knew what to do. You know, the sort of top down, aren't we smart? The president's really smart. Ray LaHood's really smart. Lisa Jackson's really smart. Sean Donovan's really smart. These are all our bosses. Weren't they visionary people? And boy, they saved them. They saved the American city. Or help save the American. We say that because we, we have to. We have to say that. But the thing that's most important in the end is that we build, and, and you have, next to me is a real leader in this, is understanding that we're building resilience at a community level. And I think uh, Scott said it earlier when he started to talk about these big trends. Shocking stuff is going to happen going forward. The old term, excuse me, shit happens. Well, big shit's going to happen. What I mean by that is Scott talked about oil prices going up. They're going to go up fast. Big oil is going to run into it. Two, storm events in this region. We haven't seen nothing yet. We have more increase of extreme rain events in this region than anywhere in the country. It's going to get, it's going to get interesting as we go forward. We're just lucky we don't have tornadoes. The financial crisis. Well, this is the big, we've had a financial crisis. We're going to continue to have financial crisis. The financial system is ripped thin like a, like a thin line. You can poke it like that and it'll ripple right through the whole thing. We've been talking about Greece for so long here in America. Well, there's probably 10 other Greases coming as we go forward. So the, this kind of world instability means our communities must be resilient. They must be able to handle this, this issue and they must be able to not get knocked on their butt every time something big happens. They've got to be strong at their core and, and, and we've got to help make that happen. I love the term sustainable urbanism. Well, what the hell does it really mean? To me, it means resilience at the community level. So those people can, can build and grow and, and have healthy lives. And indeed, some of what's been talked about here, the old zoning's got to go. Let's listen to the people for what they want. And let's zone and plan around their needs. They need transit. They need transportation. They need healthy communities. They need good housing. The fact that we're working together to try to bring that to them is really exciting. But in the end, it's about them cleaning up the communities and getting those things in the long run. Because it may be, and it will be for sure, that our boss will leave. You know, if it's not, obviously, we hope he's there through November and we have jobs for the next three years. But after that, it may not be him. It may be, you know, somebody a whole lot different. And uh, so we have to have communities that can withstand that as they go forward. That, to me, is the measure of what this is all about. And uh, that's what we're trying to do together when we really get serious about, about sustainable communities um, in New England. So thank you very much. So, uh, I, I guess, uh, let me start off with one question um, for you guys. Uh, and uh, we, I think we have at least five minutes before Mayor Barris arrives. So um, if we'll just take questions and, until uh, we have to set it up with the teleprompters and whatever they're called, video conference. Um, so let me start off with a question. Um, to what extent does Health and Human Services play a role in any of your partnerships? To, to the extent that you have vulnerable communities, um, do you find that they are a missing partner at the table? Um, or are you really working on projects that don't touch on their concerns? And I'm sure there are other questions. I, I mean, let, let me take a shot, because I just had an experience that speaks to your question. Uh, we had a meeting with the HHS uh, administrator. Barbara and I had a wonderful meeting with all of our regional administrators. And we asked her exactly you know, kind of we're, do you see yourself connected? She said she's spending so much time on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, there's hardly enough bandwidth for her to do this. She's out all the time trying to figure out how to get that in. So that's sort of number one. But number two, I was in South Providence yesterday, meeting with the Environmental Justice League, and it was a great meeting. I mean, this resilient community business, I'm so proud of what EPA has done in terms of getting the Justice League up and operating. And, you know, things like the Healthy Corner Store Initiative and the Big Bus, and they now have young people being pulled together as organizers, and I know some Brown students are involved, and anything you're doing to, to be part of that, it's terrific. And then one woman raised her hand and she said, oh, but I'm part of the Childhood Light Action Project. It was on the NBC News last night that CDC has pulled the funding 
on the data management of measuring childhood lead poisoning in America. I said to myself, well, duh. I mean, how can we be working on the Affordable Care Act and then we're pulling, pulling the funding for childhood lead? All those children who avoid lead poisoning because of that work, and EPA is very proud of that, I know HUD's been doing that, those people are going to be burdens on the healthcare system for years to come, and, and maybe even the prison system for years to come, because as it turns out, if you're poisoned with lead, your, your, your likelihood to, to, to end up in some kind of criminal activity is higher, blah, 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 and we all know all that. So I think we do need to engage HHS. Maybe they can help be a voice, because they're going to end up with all the issues that we don't do well with. If we don't make our, commu our urban communities healthy, we don't, if they're not resilient, if they're not places people can grow and prosper, they become Catherine, is it, is it, how do you say it? Sibelius? Uh, Sibelius. Sibelius' problem. And that's not what we want. So we need to do some integration here. Well, yeah. and it's, uh, yeah, I, I do have some, I think that the um, Sustainable Communities Initiative at the federal level started with these three agencies represented here today. But the White House has something called the Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. There's a lot of initiatives and different partnerships out there, so my head spins a little bit. But when I dug into that, that is one that brings in HHS and importantly, in my opinion, Department of Justice, DOJ, into the relationship um, with a smaller role for Department of Labor and SBA. So I do think that at least at the federal level, there is an attempt to try and link these issues. And sometimes it's small steps to kind of counteract what you were saying, uh, but I do know that one of the things that the Secretary of HUD always says is your health can be determined by your zip code and we have to change that. And I know that here in Providence, in prior, my prior life, we worked in Olneyville and it started with the Brownfields cleanup that turned into Riverside Park, which has a five mile bike path now, has affordable housing, involves the Providence Housing Authority, involves neighborhood arts groups, the local elementary school, and the local police department. So all of those elements are, were coming together through the Olneyville Collaborative, which started with 12 organizations and has about two dozen now. So when I was on the ground doing that, I said, oh, HUD has this new program called Choice Neighborhoods, and they want resident engagement. And lo and behold, I wind up at HUD now administering this award that Providence was one of only two cities in New England to get a planning grant last year of $250,000 because the work had been done in Olneyville led by so many great community leaders to try and intentionally link those issues. And I know at one point Olneyville Housing had a staff person, they didn't know how to keep them on board, but they were doing a lot of this out outreach on health issues. And lo and behold, um, the terrific Peter Simon Department of Health found a grant that was available. And we were able to keep someone employed in Olneyville who was doing that outreach and trying to engage people. And the free clinic that's there, trying to reach out, um, bilingual, bicultural staff, uh, trying to reach out to many um, immigrants who are uh, fearful of using the health service. So we, um, it is kind of uh, a morally uh, <coughs> unacceptable that people shouldn't get the health care that they need. Um, and it's connected to the schools, and it's connected to the housing, and it's connected to places to recreate and use that river. I mean, there are now um, blue heron on the Wenasquatucket. So if you're the executive director of United Way, Tony Maioni, he looks out one window and he sees this incredible river and swans and blue heron and turtles. And he looks out the other window and he sees Olneyville Square, today's modern, very um, busy uh, square. But I do know that that is also the target. I see my friend Tom Deller at the back of looking at that as a way to how do we enhance that square to build the businesses there and, and the, the jobs that, that creates locally. So I do think Nobody's trying to be an expert in all these areas, but I do think when there's leadership and some vision, we are trying to at least link those uh, issues uh, across agencies, and HHS has to be a component. I've gone out on lead paint announcements together uh, with Christy Hager, and we are trying to find more opportunities to be together and to link the issues. So at least the question's been raised, we're trying, and we have a lot more to do. Yeah, and then I, um, I just want to add that um, it's one of our challenges in keeping our group small enough that we can accomplish things, but also include others at our table who can also 
in part changed. And uh, it's one of our one of our metaphors is that the three of us, we're all uh, our agencies are, are um, we're in a we're, we're going steady. But we also have other agencies that we're dating on the side. So um, while we have our meeting, <laughs> while we have our meetings monthly, we also include other agencies either on the phone or if they can travel to us, they're welcome as well, like uh, FEMA and USDA, um, and also and Veterans Administration, um, and also uh, livable communities are often walkable communities, and it's been studied that uh, there are public health benefits to taking transit. One of the things I know we're time is short that I wanted to say is that while we are doing this interagency silo busting, and I really do see some progress, which is great, um, although we have a long way to go. I just wanted to say that at HUD we're really old. It's an agency that in the Clinton years had 15,000 employees and now just about 9,000. And the average age is 55. And we have the highest percentage of a federal agency of folks who are eligible for retirement, which is both an opportunity to challenge so for the young students in the room, I challenge you to think about government service because we need the new skill sets that you bring. I think that one of the things that I feel committed to doing is some internal silo busting at HUD. And we have our own silos to do. And I know that I've been out, I've chosen at least one city in each of the states. And we go out with public housing and our community planning people, and our multifamily people, and our fair housing people, who don't even know the environmental justice people at EPA. But we're going out at least together because we have a lot of silos internally, and that requires work too. But I think it's also, when I think about the workforce in the future, and some of us won't be around forever, I think about some of the people in this audience who might again think about government as a place to go, because I know that when I finished graduate school, I did not. And now I, ne I never thought I would be a federal government, but I see there are a lot of frustrations, but there's a lot of fascinating work. That's what we talk about. Uh, we're very green. We, we ride the train together, and the cafe car is a very dangerous place. You know? <laughs> We've drummed up lots of ideas. But I do urge the people here at Brown and your students, Hillary, to think about that. And I would be willing to talk to any of them about what it might mean to come into the federal government. Um, there are still. Uh, hiring's going on, um, not as many as we would like at times. Here's a question. I, I know you don't have a lot of time left, but I, I really am very curious. As we talk about sustainable communities, one of the biggest issues that I, in my field of work, deal with is access to health care. And we all know that HSS and all of its sister organizations make it virtually impossible to open clinics, to develop hospitals, and that there's a whole myriad of issues associated with that. But I'm, I'm really curious as to when we talk about sustainable communities, whether the issue of healthcare is, is on the forefront. And one of the, the agencies that you're either dating or are they really at the table? Hmm. I'm the, well, the, the healthcare system, that can't be simple. No. There's no simple No, answer. we're not we're not trying to integrate the healthcare. We're trying to make more healthy people, right? When we clean up a brownfield or a super fun site and we're trying to make that site uh, clean enough and, and meet a part per billion of dioxin or a, or a new this or that, we're trying to make that community more healthy. But um, what you're speaking to, I think, is really important. And I'm trying to get our group to think about it. It's outcomes that matter. So if, if we clean up that site, but that community is unhealthy, we haven't really, all we've done is we've made a safe site. We haven't made that community more healthy. So what have we really done? We spent a lot of taxpayer money. I mean, lots of taxpayer money. The cleanup of the Centerdale, which you guys may know, up in, at the top of the $800 million cleanup. Nice. You should see what we have to do there. Uh, I'm working on a cleanup in, the, in New Bedford. We have spent $400 million, and we need to spend another $400 million, and we get $15 million a year to spend $400 million. I'm dead by the time that's cleaned up. And I've told people that's not the outcome I'm looking for. But you, you make the great point. Um, unless this stuff, unless we're about healthy people, and we're trying to get that connected, um, 
we, we, we aren't really solving. I, I think we, we, we on the other hand, if it gets too complex, we're not gonna get anywhere. Yeah, HHS isn't in the dance as much as it should be, but there's lots of, I think that one of the principles of livability is the whole ability to walk and to access, and I yes. always say if the, you know, if a mother keeps her kids in front of the TV five hours a day, it's not safe to go down to the neighborhood park if there happens to even be one. Then that's a, that's a rational choice. So if we have safe streets and they can go to safe parks, that works. And if they're feeding them no greens because there are greens, and as you were saying, the access to healthy food. So that may not involve HHS, but I do think healthy living and all of that is driven through in different ways. So, so it, it, we could have a more direct dating relationship, but at least it's sort of in our sphere of thinking. So when EPA's budgets are getting cut, I mean really cut, because we have a lot of people on the ground helping those things happen, it, it's a conversation that needs to happen. Because I think we, we feel like some of what we're doing keeps them out of their system. And that would be great. Thank you. Would everybody please uh, join me in thanking this